It's really my pleasure to introduce Fan Lee. Uh, I know Fan for a very long time. Fan is a professor of statistical sciences and professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics at the Duke University. Uh, she started her career at Duke in 2008. She got her PhD from Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, Fan and I overlap when she was a PhD student, and I was a very, very, very young junior faculty. And I, I learned Bayesian uh, no, statistics no. from you. <laughs> no, I don't no, that, that, so. I took your class. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, oh. Yeah, oh, that's around great. 2003. Really? Oh my God! Don't don't say that. So <laughs> yeah, I was I, I I was teaching to you know vision statistics when I was just only 16 years old. But anyway, so <laughs> she was then a PhD student at Johns Hopkins with Konstantin Frangakis. I don't know how many of you know about Konstantin. Konstantin was a PhD student of Don Rubin, um, and he developed the the foundational idea of uh, um, principle. Principal certification. I was thinking principal, <laughs> principal certification. So anyway, so although Fanley is at Duke, I think she also got some of the causal inference learning from from this 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 part of the world. So I'm just gonna stop here and give the audience to you, Fanley, and she's gonna um, have a tutorial for a couple of hours. So we will have a break uh, in the middle, and so I uh, hope you will enjoy. Thank you, Fan, for coming. Thanks, Francesca. Well, thanks uh, everyone for coming. Uh, so this is okay. So this is mostly based on a, a paper, a review paper I wrote, uh, published last year, uh, on the royal philosophical transaction <coughs> of the royal society. And then recently, I, I found some uh, old of uh, Newton, uh, Isaac Newton, uh, also publishing. <laughs> philosophical transactions, so I all of a sudden feel, wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, anyway, so this is the, uh, so first of all, I want to ask the audience, uh, I assume most of you have a little bit knowledge about causal inference, or, okay, I see a happy nodding, and also I assume most of you know a little bit about Bayesian. Okay, so great, so then, uh, so then I can quickly go through the, the first part, um, because today, um, so, this was, I was working on causal inference for a long time, and also, as you just heard, I learned, I took my first Bayesian class in 2003 from Francesca at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so then over, and then I, I went to Duke. Duke is a very strong hold uh, in Bayesian statistics. So then I started to ask myself, okay, so Bayesian and causal inference, when you combine the two, what is special? So then that motivates, when I wrote this uh, review, I don't want to just, uh, Revise. I don't want to just give a catalog of what has been done when people are doing Bayesian and uh, and causal inference. I want to see that what is special about combining these two, and so that will be the the main theme of today's uh, uh, tutorial. Uh, okay, just a very very quick summary, like because everyone most people know causal inference, so I just quickly uh, talk about what, in my view, what is uh, causal inference about. So we all know statistics. Uh, uh, infers association between variables, okay? And then probably lesson one in any st an elementary statistic class is association does not Im imply causation, okay? So then this seemed to be, okay, then what, 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 what are we doing here? <laughs> well, turn out that statistical, inf what we'll call it statistical causal inference, it's mostly about uh, building a framework. So this framework is first, it defines what is a causal effect you know, using those variables and using some concepts. And once, then the second is once you define this framework, what you need to specify some assumptions under which you can identify causation from association. Remember, just, just a plan, just without any assumption, you cannot say association is causation. But we cannot stop there. So causal inference is about give you a framework. Once you define what is causal effect, you can specify assumptions such that you can identify causation from association. And then, of course, whenever we have association assumptions, it can be violated. So then the third component to me is to, specify, to assess the sensitivity within this framework to the violation of those key assumptions. So that is, this is statistical causal inferences about. 
Um, so then there are several frameworks to this. And then traditionally, uh, structured equation models and the uh, DAG, the Bayesian network. And then I, I would argue the, the primary framework now uh, used at least in statistics and medicine uh, in, in social science or econ is the potential of outcome framework or the so-called counterfactual framework that was first uh, conceived by Neyman uh, 100, over 100 years ago and then advocated by, uh, well, then pushed uh, forward by uh, Rubin in the 70s. Uh, okay, so just overall, so what is this framework about? Is um, There are many causal problems, but this framework is to evaluate. So it is centered on this thing, uh, on this goal, is try to evaluate the effect of a treatment or intervention, which is cause. Basically, the cause is specified here uh, on the outcome. Okay, so you have a, a cause, you have a treatment or intervention, and then you have outcome. You want to evaluate the effect of that cause or uh, outcome. So, so it's a very focused uh, task. It turns out that even that is not easy. Okay, so the main challenge of this is, of course, confounding. So there are factors that affect both the treatment and the outcome, and those are the hard parts. So that. Again, that's a very quick run over of things. So then I, I get into the, uh, uh, you know, the Bayesian part or the, the framework uh, quickly now. Um, so some, we need some uh, setup and notation. So assume we have data. So this data is a simple, ran so it's a random sample of n units from a population. The concept of population called inference is very important. What is your target population? Because we have a sample. We sample. We have a sample draw from target population. We can do an inference on the sample, but we really want to make conclusions to the target population. So the sample and population are different. Uh, they, they are, of course, they, if you have simple random sample, they are the same. But often that's uh, very uh, that can be different. So I will leave that uh, for another day, but just keep that in mind. So then we have, let's say we have a treatment. Again, to make life easy, let's assume the treatment is only bi binary. Um, uh, then for each unit, we observe the treatment status, we denote by Z. At Harvard, especially bio statistics, people like to use A. Uh, but here I use Z. <laughs> In the Harvard, on the other side of Charles River, people use Z. Um, so uh, <laughs> stat department use Z. So covariates, I say X, and the outcome Y. Okay, so those are all observed. And then uh, what is uh, potential outcome is for each unit, there are two potential outcomes, Y1 and Y0. Of course, when I say each unit have two potential outcomes, I already implicitly assume there's the so-called stable unit, uh, the pseudo assumption. Basically, say there's no interference and also no different version of a treatment. Uh, those are all, all pretty standard. And then from now on, I will use bold to denote the vector of those, like this variable to denote the uh, whole data of the, the sample. Okay, this is all standard. And then, so we need to define causal effects. So that's called causal estimate. Those are basically the quantities that are defined in causal, uh, by potential outcome or counterfactual. Those are called counterfactuals, okay? Because you don't always observe both. And so then we have a bunch of estimate that define on the potential outcomes. Those are the standard ones. So they can be individual treatment back. Basically for the same person, for the same person, had I been able to Con uh, assign this person to treatment versus control, then what the outcome would be. So that's, I usually use a Greek letter tau to uh, denote the uh, treatment effect. And then this uh, correspondingly is, uh, there's something called the conditional average treatment effect, or Kate. Uh, is the treatment effect, is the treatment effect of the units, of the units that, you know, share, that have the same covariate value x. So that is uh, Kate, and it can be different across different x. And then for the, for, for a very long time, people uh, talk about average treatment effect, the Pate, uh, the the Pate. So population average treatment effect, or average treatment effect, ATE. That's just this Kate or this ITE. You can think of this as an average over a target population. So it's ex expectation. And here I didn't write as the uh, the uh, the over a population. Okay. So so this is. This is kind of the, there, there are many other estimates, especially if you, for example, if you are in Baustat, uh, survival outcome is, a uh, time to event outcome is common, and then you have other things, and the binary, you will have ratio, but the, you get the idea, okay? Uh, so we all know that fundamental problem of causal inference is, well, it's great, all this definition, because you are comparing the same person uh, the, the, under two counterfactual conditions. Uh, so it sounds pretty reasonable. I would claim that this is pretty reasonable. But then the question is, 
well, this fundamental problem of causal inference is, well, you've only got observed one of the two. So you observe the potential outcome corresponding to the, corresponding to the actual, uh, so, so the actual treatment, corresponding to the actual treatment, like the, the outcome that corresponding to actual treatment. So mathematically, you can, define, uh, you, you can write this. So I usually denote the observed outcome as yi, just, just y. Sometimes I use y ops to emphasize this is observed. And the other one is missing, OK? So, so once you look at this, you realize, oh, well, so at least half of the data are missing. All right, half of the data uh, missing in, in any data, like because the causal estimate is defined as the uh, contrast of potential outcomes. Uh, actually, you observe only one of them. Uh, so essentially, uh, causal inference you can view it as a missing data problem. But this is not like whatever pro missing data problem. This is a clearly a structural, very stru the the missing data is very structured. Um, so. So if you know a little bit of history about the, the uh, causal inference and the missing data, you know that these two things are very uh, closely connected. And uh, Don Rubin in the 70s, so in the 74, if you see here, in the 74 paper, 78, around that time he was working on causal inference. But you probably also remember missing data has the, uh, the most classic paper, the 76 paper, biometrical paper on missing data. And so that is, not a coincidence. You realize the connection between the two because, uh, and actually the 78 paper, interestingly, the 74 paper is giving the idea. 78 paper, Anos paper, is actually about Bayesian inference of causal effect. It just for the longest time, then people actually uh, stop working on Bayesian. But originally, this was all connected. It's because this is, you can view this whole problem as a missing data problem. Okay? Um, so, well, it's almost in the sense that you're missing half of the data. So the simplest thing you can think of is, well, I'm going to impute. If somehow I can find the observed data to impute the missing data, I can do causal inference, right? So well, you can do that, but you need more assumptions. Uh, so then this, uh, so we need more assumptions. So we, we can have structural assumptions or uh, stochastic modeling assumptions. Again, so another quick review is, so in the assumptions, and the majority of the causal study assume versions of an ignorable assignment or ignorability. Um, so that's just con consists of two sub-assumptions. The first is the unconfoundedness assumption, or it's uh, selection on -select uh, observables or no unmeasured confounding. So there are many names. So essentially, says this says that every unit, say treatment assignment, is only conditional on the uh, observed x. Uh, so what? Well, sorry. Only condition on the observed x. So it essentially say that there's no unmeasured confounders. Okay, so this is an untestable assumption, but a lot of paper, a lot of work assume that. And second is the overlap assumption, or also known as a positivity assumption. I'll just say that every person's, uh, uh, every unit, the uh, probability of being assigned to treatment or control is bounded away from zero and one. So this is testable. So people take it for granted, uh, and it turns out that this is actually ultra important. In, in causal inference that uh, it's uh, uh, become more prominent in recent years. And then anyway, so once you have the unconfoundedness assumption, the nice thing is then you can get rid of the, those two conditions. Uh, then you can just we usually denote the propensity score by E. Uh, it's it just uh, the probability of being assigned to treatment given X. So this is called the propensity score. And this thing plays a central role in, in causal inference. Actually, it become clear later also in the, in the Bayesian approach, this is also important, uh, a little bit, uh, almost like a, a paradox, but I will get, the po uh, get, get to that. So this is a very quick view of things, right? Um, so now, once you have those assumptions, so that, yes? OK, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Um, and I want to ask you, you know this SIFA, I don't know if you're getting to the SIFA assumption. Uh, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to get, get into, uh, for, for this uh, tutorial, okay. no. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So I was wondering, how does the exchangeability, the De Finetti's exchangeability relate? Does it relate at all to SIFA? How does it relate to causal inference? <laughs> I actually, very, you, you're getting, uh, so it's actually related here. Um, I actually get rid of the De Finetti because I feel it's complicated. So, oh. Yeah, yeah. So it, I don't think it's related to Sudova. But it's it's very important when we start to talk about you know when we talk about um, 
you know, later when I build a model for things, and then I have a parameter, and I say there exists a prior. So, so, so that, so, so, it is related, but it's, I don't think it's related for for Sudova. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's related to uh, to actually the, the fact that you can rewrite the joint distribution in the product of those individuals. But but that's that's actually an important point. I was. Uh, earlier when I wrote things, I always put the definity, but then I realized I can just uh, assume something weaker is just conditional independence. But that, yeah, that's too technical. Uh, I, okay, I'm, I'm, okay, so let's go back. Oh. oh, okay, yeah. Go back to this. So now I, I have those assumptions. So then once I have some assumptions, so remember, causal effect is about the potential outcome. What do you want to, causal effect is defined on potential outcome, but what we do have is an observed outcome, right? So we want to connect the two. So what do we do is, well, why we can do this is because under ignorability, then we can actually prove that, this is actually relatively easy to prove that this, the distribution of the potential outcome, which means, this basically means that if you can go have a population, if you can go to assign everyone hypothetically to the treatment, what the average outcome would be, this is, the, this is a different quantity. This says that I just go to my population, grab the people who indeed take the treatment, what their outcome would be. So because this is, remember, there's a selection in the treatment, who get which. These two things will not be exactly the same without any uh, assumption. But this assumption, this, this ignorability, these two, two things actually are the same. So this basically says that, well, this is my causal quantity, define my causal effect. This is what I can actually estimate from my real data. This is essentially association, association between y given z and x. These two things are equal. So that's why this assumption is so important. Uh, and because of that, what you can do is you just simply calculate. So what you can do is, you know, once this is, we call this outcome model, outcome surface. It's basically the outcome given the treatment and x. So in other words, I can, so we can, uh, so this is a, let's say this outcome, this is true outcome function, it's just mu, I don't know, it's mu, it's a function of x and z, the function of y as a function of x and z. So once you have this, and then you can, so this is all, you know, identification, again, another thing in causal inference is we separate identification and estimation. Identification basis say that, oh, what they call this estimate can be expressed by the, the true values of things, <laughs> observed things. But estimation is, you still need, you don't need, you don't know this, right? So you still need to specify a model to estimate that. So that's it's a different concept, but it's closely connected. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so here I can just, so what, what in practice we do is given those results, I can just specify a model. Like very simple, go to the treatment group, do a regression. Go, go to the control group, do a regression. And then I can just use that to predict. For each person, I can predict what is the outcome under the counterfactual, the alternative treatment based on those outcome. And then I can just product, I can just, ident I can just estimate any estimate you can think of. Right, so if a Kate is just plugging the X, and if the, pay, uh, if the ATE, I just uh, average over everything. Um, so this is, so this, I use this mu hat. This is the outcome function that you predicted. Uh, you, you are using a model to fit, again, fit to this data, okay? So, so that is all very simple. The, this is called outcome modeling approach. That's turned out to be like the most relevant to most relevant to the Bayesian uh, analysis. So if you think of what is Bayesian, Bayesian is everything you have a model, then model have some parameters, and then you have a prior for the parameter, and then you use the Bayesian crank, Bayesian theorem to get the posterior, right, of the, the parameters. So the key in Bayesian approach are two things. One is a model. Model, model on what? Model on the outcome model. In, in cause inference, model on the outcome model. And then you need priors. So those two things. So you can see that just fundamentally, Bayesian inference, uh, well, if you want to do Bayesian causal inference, then you, a key is you need to have this, those outcomes, uh, outcome function models. We, we're building a model on that. And then, of course, if you're familiar with causal inference, you know that uh, there are different way approach of identification. Another approach is use a propensity score to uh, inverse probability weighting. And another thing is called double robust or augmented IPWs, combine the two. But I will, so for now, we will see 
have that on surface, outcome model is a key uh, identification uh, framework to the Bayesian approach or model-based approach to causal inference. Um, so, yeah, it's just, uh, it took me uh, <laughs> a bit, uh, quite some time to, to go through the, uh, the background, even though I know most of you know a bit about causal inference, I still think it's good to kind of give an overview of this and see where we are. Uh, so now let's say we want to do Bayesian inference of causal effect. So step back to think what's the problem we're really having is we have causal effect defined in counterfactuals. We're missing half of those potential outcomes or counterfactuals. So a very simple idea is I, if I can impute those missing potential outcomes, I'm good. Okay. So or in other words, treating causal inference as a missing data problem and then just impute those missing data, build a model, impute those missing data. And so let's think about this. Uh, so essentially, uh, this is a problem like you are having, I, for each sample unit, I have four quantities. So four variables, y0, y1, z, and x. And three of them are observed. So of course, the treatment and x are observed. There's one uh, here, I particularly write as ops, is one of the two is observed, the other is missing, right? So then it's a, and I wrote this already before, so there's a given z, if you know who's treated, and which most of the time we do know, there's a one-to-one -one map between the observed data and missing data and the y1, y0. So what do we do is, so Bayesian inference would uh, view all the quantities as random variables and then build a model for them, build a model for them and, and of course, this parameter, and then derive posterior inference of those, you know, because those, so, so if anything, um, okay, so all the variables, the, the missing data, okay, the key thing is the missing data is viewed as uh, also missing unobserved random variables. So we can also treat them the same way as parameters. I haven't get into the concept of parameters, but Essentially, we are building, we are kind of, we can impute, get the posterior predictive distribution of those missing y's, okay? Um, so, so yeah, so missing, so from this perspective, missing potential outcomes are drawn from the posterior distribution of, uh, uh, their posterior predictive distribution, so there's no different from them, uh, from unmeasured, unknown parameters. Okay, what do I mean? So this is a key, uh, this, this is a key uh, slides. Uh, so this is where uh, Sharon Lee asked about the definity. It used to be like, it would be important to put here, but I simplify that. So, so the, the thing is, you know, if you're, if you're Bayesian, you, you would need a joint distribution for all of these things. So this is where you'll, you'll start from, right? So we have, this is a joint distribution of all the random variables, basically all the data I have for all units. So this one. And, uh, but I assume that this, uh, this is governed, so the joint distribution, I basically assume that there's a joint distribution, um, and this joint is uh, governed by a generic parameter, uh, so I wrote this, so it consists of three parts, conditional on which those, this can be decomposed as the ID products of uh, each unit, um, unit version of that joint distribution. Again, this is just simplify things. Um, so, so just, just uh, sometimes I, I, I evoke, um, oh, I just, just make, make this. I've, so let's just say the joint distribution can be, there's a parameter, exists a parameter so that uh, you c they're ID, okay? Uh, so there's some technicality there. Uh, I, I'm not, not getting, getting into that. So the key thing is now, I can just look at each of them. And then this is complicated, even though there are four variables, it's still complicated, it's much easier if we can decompose this into something that is more uh, doable. So if you look at this, so what does this mean uh, is, so I decompose this into this three part. The first part is z given, the, so it's a z distribution of given everything else. Then is the outcome given x, and then it's x itself. So why do I do this? So this part is, we call it assignment mechanism. This is how this describes the model for how the treatment is assigned, okay? Um, and this part is, then once I condition on this, the z goes away, right? So this is, say, what's the, uh, this model says, 
what the outcome, we call it the potential outcome model or outcome model. So this says what the outcome model, what outcome is a function of the covariate. And then finally, it's just a covariate distribution, right? So this, now we are essentially decomposed. We, we decompose the, uh, the joint distribution, rather complex joint distribution, by into product of three conditional distribution are arguably easier to deal with. So the key part is, remember we assume ignorability. If you still remember what is ignorability, just say that this distribution does not depend on y1 and y0, right? So, so this complicated part becomes just a propensity score model, the probability of z given x here, you know, and this is, so this just become a propensity score, this is an outcome, this is covariate, okay? So, so then thus you can see that why, the, it's also funny, uh, people find ignorability assumption, why it's called ignorability, it's actually turned out to be it's a Bayesian concept. People know ignorability for the longest time, think, oh, it's equivalent to unconfoundedness, but it's really a Bayesian, initially, Historically, it's the Bayesian concept because why do we call it ignorable? It's because later, under some more assumptions, this part, this propensity score dropped away, dropped out from the likelihood, okay? But, but this, keep, keep in mind, this is say, this gives a path, this is a key contribution of the Rubin 78 paper, give you a path to say that, well, this, is, this complicated joint, uh, joint likelihood can be defined, de I haven't, include the, the priors yet, right? But this says that, well, you can decompose into three models, propensity score, outcome, and the x itself, okay? So, um, I, I, I'm not sure whether I, I want to go, this has become too technical, uh, so what I just want to say is uh, uh, then, what, oh, I forgot, so, so okay. This is about the distribution. Remember, step back. What we want to do is we still want to do inference for all those causal estimates, right? For all those causal estimates, we still want to have those things. Uh, we, want to, we want to do inference of those and one is missing. So now we are looking at the likelihood and then we can, based on the likelihood, we can possibly impute the missing potential outcome and then we are probably good. Uh, so uh, it turned out that technically there's some, uh, some, some subtleties there, and I'm, I'm not, I, I feel that it's probably, I'm not going into the details, but what I just want to say that it turned out the average treatment effect, there are actually different version of that, and that will affect how you do the Bayesian inference. Uh, very slightly, but in practice, the, the difference between all the three different versions are, are quite small. Uh, just very quickly want to run through this, just say, well, it turned out that you can have a sample average treatment effect. That's essentially you are treating your um, your sample as your target population. It's like that's all you, you need to know. Uh, and uh, so there's a, there, there another one is uh, the population. The common one we, we, we deal with is, is actually population average treatment effect. Uh, what I just want to say that if you really go into the technical part, you realize the population average treatment effect actually involves both the outcome, like I use this uh, theta y to denote the parameter for the outcome model, I use x to denote the, um, uh, the, the parameter for the covariate. Uh, so it turned out that technically, the population version of average treatment effect actually involves both an outcome model and the covariate model. I mean, that, that's, that's just technicality, okay? And then the, uh, so, so what, what, does, what do I mean is that, you know, if you are, people normally actually care about the population average, because we don't want to just make an argument about our sample. We want to ha have argument about the whole population. But then you, in principle, you need to have a, a model also for X, uh, because that, that is just from theoretical perspective, that it's there. But in reality, nobody really want to model X. Nobody want to, especially if you have a high dimensional X like in epi study in Baustad, we have a lot of covariates like the per characteristic of a person. Why do I care about Y? I care about outcome. Why do I bother to model this X, right? So what people actually do in practice implicitly for a long time is they condition on X. 
They just a conditional x. So this the, the sample I have, I just conditional on the x, and then I ca I impute my potential outcomes, and then I'm done, right? So technically, that actually is a different estimate. That actually turned out to be a mix, a hybrid between this population version and sample version. Uh, <laughs> so we give it a name. It's a uh, it's a mate because originally I was thinking of a hybrid, and then become a hate. So that's not. <laughs> so it become mate. Uh, so so what what this really is is just we actually don't model x. We just conditional on x, and then we are having still have a parameter. And then this is really as far as I can see, most of the Bayesian causal inference. This is actually estimate they are using. It's just they didn't even realize they were doing this conditioning. But again, that's all. Technic technicality is a very subtle difference, and in practice, it doesn't matter too much. Conceptually, uh, it's important to know what, what do we get that. So, so, um, so, made is just a convenient approximation of uh, PET, mostly done implicit in Bayesian inference. So, the concept of population sample mixed version of the same estimate uh, applies to also non-additive estimates. So, it's a general concept, not just for ATE. Uh, and then I. I have some example, but I, I feel that this is not too important. Have an example of, in a simple case, what are those different estimates would uh, be. So I always skip that. Um, so it's more important. So okay, now about how do we do inference? So now we 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 have we, we get an idea of the estimate, different version of the estimate, and then it's really how do you how do you do it? I turn out there are two different approach. Uh, the first approach I already mentioned is you, you just you basically just impute the missing potential outcomes, right, for each unit. Uh, and I'm going to talk in a moment how to do that uh, from the posterior predictive distribution. And then for each person, you just impute this host, and then you can just calculate whatever estimate you want. Uh, well, the second one is, well, if we look at this guy, if we look at this, it's really, well, actually, let's look at this. It's really if, if I know the outcome, the, the parameter of the outcome model, that's it. I, that's the only thing I need. So if I, I build a model, and then if my estimate can be written as a function of the parameter of y, then I, I don't even need to do this imputation. I can just directly, so, so I can direct, so what I can do is I specify outcome model, okay? And then express a causal estimate as a closed form functions solely of the parameters. So then I can just look at the, uh, Parameters. I don't even need to impute those missing potential outcomes. Um, so, so that's called the model uh, model parameter perspective. Um, I will talk that the more uh, later. So this is all good. This because this bypass is pretty cumbersome. You impute the missing potential outcome. The downside of that is the downside of that is not always feasible for ATE. This is easy because you can always write everything ATE in a, in a closed form of the parameters. But you have some estimate like this, like the probability of y1 give it larger than y0. This is there's no way you can express that as a function. Uh, well, most of the time you cannot. Uh, or something like principal straight straight causal effect. There's a latent variables there, and so so like ultimately we will still need to like we still need to get to this part. So we still cannot avoid imputing. But but the uh, philosophically or the uh, Conceptually, there are at least these two things, a different type of approach. Uh, in practice, we <laughs> probably need to use both. But the idea is that in this approach, you need to get the posterior distribution of cause as meant uh, from that of a model parameters, with or without imputing each missing potential outcome. So this all sounds pretty uh, you know, high level. I will give an example pretty quickly. Before that, I, uh, then I talk, this is still about the model based, right? I'm, I'm still talking about SMN. I still haven't introduced even prior. OK, so now how do we do Bayesian? Do Bayesian, you have an outcome model. Uh, that's not enough. You have a parameter. Then you need a prior. You need a prior distribution for those parameters. So the question is, OK, what kind of priors we get and on what parameters we should get those priors? We should impose those priors. So it turned out there's a third assumption. So this is something unique to, call the, uh, to Bayesian called the inference. In frequentist domain, you don't need this assumption. Okay? And this turned out to be actually a pretty important assumption. The third one is called prior independence. So, so this the parameter for the assignment mechanism, z, the theta z, and then for the outcome, 
And also for the covariance, well, if you are doing the conditional do the mate, you don't need to worry about that. But the key thing is those the parameters for these two different models, they are a priori, a priori distinct and independent. So this is actually turned out to be a very important assumption. And in high dimensional cases, it turned out that this is basically act as an uh, informative prior. Uh, I will get that in a moment. But this is assumption also for the longest time. People do Bayesian causal inference, take it for granted. And uh, as later I mentioned that uh, actually Francesca did some nice work um, not relying on this, but that's for later. So anyway, so once I have this assumption, what we can do is we can just impose separate priors for each of those parameters. And then, remember, I have my likelihood. I earlier had my likelihood. And I impose this prior independence because of priors. This become, so now I will use the Bayesian crank. I have my posterior distribution of all these parameters. So what are those? This is just a proportional to the likelihood and times all the priors, right? So this, this all looks, looks like this. So this is about the outcome model. This is about the treatment assignment. This is about the outcome model, OK? And uh, so, the, so we know that the posterior of the, uh, uh, so we know that for the, uh, pay, uh, for, for the population version of ATE, it doesn't really uh, depend on Z, right? It doesn't depend on Z. So this is this part the propensity score, so, so this one has nothing. So if you assume ignorability, the treatment assignment has nothing to do with why. So this doesn't fact, this section doesn't factor anything into the ATE. Okay, so this part goes away. So that's why the name, this is where the name ignorable, ignorable comes from. So it's very interesting that you can see that ignorability, this as concept actually was a Bayesian concept. Um, but people take it for granted. It's like it's a uh, it's it's funny that uh, we will talk about ignorability and then didn't realize. Well, this is actually originally was a was a Bayesian concept. So why is it ignorable? Just say that well, the propensity score or the treatment assignment can drop out from the likelihood if you are assuming the prior independence. So then in the end, we are just we just come up with. We just need to worry about this part and this part. As I said, in practice, we don't care. We usually don't want to model this. We just condition on this. This part also goes away. So everything important it just become an outcome model and the uh, parameters for that outcome model. Yes. And I'm wondering um, if at some point um, we will be talking about the challenge of Bayesian inference in this context, because if you want to be, I know you're going to, I don't wonder mm -hmm. whether you want to go there, and I think it's important to yeah. submit for the discussion, is the fact that if you want to be fully, fully Bayesian, right? Absolutely. To estimate theta z, yes. you need, from a Bayesian viewpoint, you're going to get the posterior distribution of theta z. A absolutely. All of the data. Absolutely. Which means, and I mentioned this because I remember presenting some of the initial idea of Bayesian causal inference to Don Rubin, and he was really mad at me because when I presented this initial idea, I said, well, we, you know, I'm Bayesian, so when I'm going to estimate the posterior distribution of theta z, conditional to all of the data, which means I'm going to use the outcome data to inform the estimation of the score which would be a huge violation. Uh, absolutely. Right? I'll talk about so that, yeah. I think it would be interesting for you that, to elaborate it, it on that. Was, because there, was a that's discussion. there was a discussion written about that in one of the yeah, that's, a, yes. yeah. that's actually, that's precisely, so I want to get to the point. Yeah, that's a feedback issue, right? You yeah. actually, Corey, wrote several very important uh, papers. Yeah. And also, in, in some sense, it's also this Originally, I got confused. The biggest question bothered me when I read this review is, what's the role of propensity score or assignment mechanism in all of this, right? So, so yes, that's actually the, the, the core, I feel, that's the most important part. Yeah, and it's yeah. exactly what, like, where Bayesian inference yeah. and propensity score gets Pro asked. Yeah, precisely. That's kind of the, uh, the main thing of it's the, more. yeah. It's actually not a war. There seems to be there's actually a reconciliation yes. later. Exactly. Yeah. So, now, so now it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well, the thing is, Don will get mad no matter what. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm not surprised, right? Well, the discussion was written by Wasserman and, and 
Jamie Robbins. <laughs> and then and then later, well, that doesn't help, right? And then another <laughs> another guy, well, not guy, it's a Nobel laureate, uh, uh, Chris Sims. Actually, they wrote uh, uh, Larry Wasman and Don, uh, and uh, Robbins wrote this. This is a very classic epic back and forth. Uh, debate of this, and and I will talk about that. Actually, this uh, that's the central problem uh, to me that in, in this case. But I, I'm spending a lot of time to talk about the the basics because uh, I assume that uh, most of the people probably are not aware of like those subtleties, right? Uh, so those again, th this is something I can quickly uh, skip because those are not those are more technical. Basically, say the four different versions of fate and the mate. They don't depend on the correlation between y1, y0, and the sample version does, so it's slightly more complicated. So, you know, those are not, not too, the key idea is this, this part. It's like most of the time, we, if you do uh, Bayesian call, okay. Most of, so the thing is, really, this prior, once you have this prior independence, which is actually a very strong assumption, these two things, you, you can throw away this thing, but life is not that easy, actually. Uh, th this actually turned out to be an important one, so I'm, I'm going to talk about that later. But if you assume this, then you can just focus on this, this outcome model, okay? But that's, uh, that becomes this paradox. Uh, so all of this uh, tech technicality stuff, I'm not going to, so you can ju do standard uh, data augmentation, impute the missing outcome and stuff. So I don't think that's too important. Uh, so I always spend, so, so what, in reality, what do we do? How do we impute the missing potential outcome? Is well, we build an outcome model, and then we are essentially using the, you know, we are like for the treated units, we impute the missing y's, uh, missing y zeros from the y ones, and for control, we're doing the opposite, right? So, uh, so imputation critically depend on this outcome model. Okay, so this is this this in high dimensional, it's also critically depend on the uh, priors. Those are pretty standard. Um, so I also have some uh, example. You you can look at the slides and the, like to the simple bivariate normal distribution, and then you can actually derive this. Uh, you can use Gibbs sampler. You can use the standard the. Uh, uh, Bayesian, Bayesian technique algorithm uh, to impute the, how do you impute, Th those are all standards, so I don't think that it takes, uh, it worth going there. But one thing I find when I was writing a review, I realized it's important, it's also, um, what does identification mean? Identifi identifiability mean? This is also an important uh, issue come up again and again. So if you are frequentist, we talk about something uh, identifiable, it's, we easy, we, what, what we meant is, well, the parameters can be expressed as a function of the observed data. So it's a clean cut. You either, parameter is either identified or not. If you're Bayesian, things actually uh, become, become uh, a bit fuzzy. They turn out to be a different version, different view of what does identifiability mean in Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian framework. So original Lindley say that, in 72 say that, well, as long as you have proper prior, your posterior is also proper. So then all primers are identifiable. That is not particularly helpful <laughs> because we know that in causal inference, we know some parameters, they don't have, you don't have data at all. So for example, I have Y1, Y0. For the same person, you never observe both. So if you care about the, say, correlation between Y1 and Y0, you never have data about that. So from frequentist, you would say clean cut is not identifiable. But the Lindley would say, no, 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 no. If you can have a row, you can have association. If I have a proper prior for this parameter, this is identifiable. And Lindley would say that's identifiable. But that's not very helpful because your prior will be exactly the posterior. So then I think that Gustafsson in, uh, has a much more useful <laughs> uh, concept. He say that. Okay, so he said that the identifiability in Bayesian paradigm is really a continuum. It's between zero and one, from weak identifiability to strong identifiability. So it's not like a zero one. So he's saying that you know identifiability depends on how diffuse the posterior distribution is. So if you if you don't have enough data, your posterior might be very diffuse. Then that is kind of weak identifiability. So again, this is all high level discussion, but this turned out to be very useful uh, in, in causal inference. Like the, 
a big so so why it's important in cause inference to differentiate that is because weakly identify I've identified parameters actually common because you anything about the two the, the correlation involve two potential outcomes. It is because you don't have data for that. You would have this weak ide weakly identified uh, five parameters. And also another example is if you are doing pr principal stratification, some estimate is defined on some latent structure. Then that's just by default, it's weakly identifiable. But then it's not that you cannot do anything about it. It's still they're weakly identified, but you can use data assumptions to make it strong, more strongly identifiable. So, so it's kind of important to, to get this point is that you know, you, you want to, to get this point out, it's like when we talk about identifiability, particularly when we talk about Bayesian, it's a continuum, it's no longer zero one. Um, that's another difference between the frequentist and the Bayesian. Um, so, okay, so then, this is importantly, I, yeah, I prepared more slides than I, I, I think that I, I thought I could cover, but that's good, you can skip. So anyway, with all of this discussion, the key, what I want to say is the key task in, in Bayesian causal inference is, particularly in, co in complex estimate, is to model the outcome model, right? At least for now, it looks like that. At least for now, the propensity score doesn't seem to play a role, uh, well, other than it, it's not that simple. So there are two general categories. One is called S learner, the single learner. Basically, you build a single model of this two thing, uh, this, uh, this outcome model, or it's like the simplest case is a linear model with the interaction term between the x and z. Or the so-called two learners, two separate models for each group. So, so for, for each group, then you can do this. So for, for linear models, these two approaches the same. But in practice, the, uh, so now more and more in high dimensional people use uh, kind of uh, like the machine learning methods like the trees, the forest, the neural networks, and then the Bayesian become very popular. You can use the BART. Uh, GP and DP mixture, so there are many of these kind of models. But you can see that really this whole approach, why I spend all this time talking is, well, after all of this, the important, uh, at least for now, is to build a model just for the outcome, and then you kind of don't need to worry about anything except that you cannot. Uh, but for now, so then uh, in Bayesian, for, we use a different, just the priors uh, to do that, uh, well, or model. So the most Famous one, most widely used is called uh, BART or the, it's, it's BART, I don't know, I assume you know something, but if you don't know, it's, to me it's essentially a Bayesian version of random forest. So you have ensemble of trees, then random forest will you know, use an ensemble of the trees to, to come with a, you know, one a summary uh, prediction. And BART essentially give, use prior to, uh, to regulate how deep, uh, how, how, how deep you the, the tree you want to go, and uh, you know how 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 do you split? Uh, so that that is just just think of Bart as a Bayesian version of random forest. Okay, so the Bart. So this is a landmark paper uh, in the uh, Jennifer uh, Hill in 2011, saying, well, why don't you just use the Bart model for this outcome outcome model? And then uh, just an outcome model, and then you, you can just get the posterior distribution for the parameters and things like that. Uh, but this idea will later actually much advanced by, uh, by those folks, uh, Hong et al. So they're saying that, well, no, no, you, it's better to reparameterize this guy, reparameterize the outcome model into two parts. The first part is a baseline distribution of the outcome, the uh, outcome, and the second part is capture the treatment effect. So this is like a Z. So the, the key thing they say that, well, to make, the, the key thing they realize is, uh, well, we care about treatment effect, but the baseline distribution of, you know, when there's no treatment might be much more complex, and we don't want to be the complexity of the two to be the same. So the idea is that if I reparameterize that, if I give a separate prior, they say, well, particularly they give separate bar prior for this baseline distribution and for the, this kind of capture, the heterogeneous treatment effect, give separate bar prior to this, this will work, work well. So they, they empirically also showed well. So this is essentially a reparameterization of things of the outcome model into two part, uh, two separate bar priors, and that, that's, they call it Bayesian forest uh, because there are two, 
two part and then it's already each part is already a forest and then two of course it's a forest <laughs> so that's called Bayesian forest but the idea is also on the uh, Bayesian it's really on the uh, reparameterization um, so there are many it turned out this this become really popular and people start to extend this whole idea also to survival outcome and then it also won a lot of like data competition in in some causal conferences, they have data, and then people use BART, particularly for use the the, B, the Bayesian random forest. Those those idea often uh, often very often beat like random forest uh, this type of approach. So that's all good. But it can, you can see that so far, I still haven't talked anything about the uh, propensity score, which is like ignorable. <laughs> but obviously, there's no free lunch, right? So it's really, so this is the key part. I think I probably will give a, I'll give the paradox before we take a break and then the second half we'll talk mostly on this. So this is really a paradox uh, like of the raw propensity in causal inference, right? So first, so far we talk on the ignorability and the prior independence, the propensity score is ignorable, right? So that's ignor <laughs> ignorability, um, but we know Propensity score plays a central role in causal inference. So it's very funny, right? In the propensity score paper was the Rosenbaum Rubin 83 paper. The, pa the, the title of that paper is the central role of propensity score in causal inference. And so this paper also was originally the ignorability concept was first proposing the Rubin 78 paper say, oh, it's ignorable. This paper says it's ignorable, they say it's central role. Like, it, it's a, so obviously on the frequency domain, it's central. And uh, with a vast, uh, also empirical evidence, this is important, right? So then this seems to be a paradox. And also I, I like, okay, so I should have go back to uh, very later, talk about, I like this quote from Dan Rubin, even though I don't always uh, agree with him, I like some of, his, I like his quote. He said that any complication that creates problems for one form of inference creates problems for all forms of inference, just in different ways. So if propensity score is so important in frequency domain, there's no way Bayesian can just magically does not depend on propensity score. But where does it come from? Where, where, where does it, where, where the, the role actually, where does that come from? So that was um, actually very important. And uh, so then if you think, uh, just step back, when we do called causal studies, causal people always say that, well, there are two different stages. One is called design stage, the other called is analysis stage. So design stage, in causal in particular means that anything, anything, well, even collect data, anything that has nothing to do with why. And design stage means anything has anything to do, with, so that has something to do with why. So, so Bayesian modeling, outcome modeling, um, if you if you assume those assumptions, prior independence, ignorability, then it seems that only involves the analysis stage. Where does the design stage factor in? Okay, so so then that will become problem. Then then I realize this this is a very important observation is if you do causal if you do the propensity score stuff, you know that this concept of overlap and the covariant balance between the two groups plays a central prominent role in the design stage. Like people do matching and weighting so that the two groups look very similar. Um, how about Bayesian? Bayesian, if you just do a model, it seems that you don't get anything. Like in the, in the model itself, so one thing I realized is when you build a model, you build a model a function of y given x and z. But the model itself doesn't tell you anything about the data, the data structure, how similar these two groups look like. So remember, causal inference is about comparing two groups. Well, actually, t two hypothetical groups. So, the, is it, but it's a counterfactual comparison. It's, a, it's, it's not just a prediction, right? So, so then this is important. So this is where actually things become tricky. That how do we, obviously, this should play an important role in Bayesian. But if we assume prior independence, we kind of throw that away. And so then it's become a push well, later the feedback issue, actually, uh, Francesca mentioned, uh, is also uh, another, I would say, an, another motivation here. So, so, well, then why does overlap or propensity score or, or, propensity score or balance matter? It's, so this is the key. So if the outcome model is correctly specified, uh, 
again, quoting Don Rubin, is if God comes down, tells you the true model, then that's all you need. You don't need anything extra, right? The posterior distribution of theta y is correct, and that's all we need. However, outcome model are really correctly specified. So whenever that model is not correctly specified, you know, when especially in the region, in the in the area that you know there's not enough, uh, the either all treatment group or a control group, or in other words, there's very little diff, uh, overlap. Then everything you have essentially is a model. So it's purely based everything model based causal uh, estimate, whether it's a Bayesian or just a frequency model based. What you do is it relies solely on extrapolation. So what's the problem of extrapolation? It's again, if your model is correctly specified, great. If it's wrongly specified, it it's, can be very far from far away from truth. So in other words, it can be very sensitive to all the outcome specification, right? And and also we want to correctly quantify the uncertainty accordingly. Okay, so this is a key. So the, the, the one key thing is outcome model itself does not take into account of the overlap into the uh, take into account of that. So then it's really important to put the propensity score in this into this outcome model uh, uh, framework. And uh, so I have a toy example which is to create a case that you have a complete uh, separation of treatment group and control group, and then things are really complicated. I'm, I'm not, I don't have uh, time to talk about that, but uh, I uh, give you five minutes, but then uh, I would say that then people realize, well, you know, even in the Bayesian approach, the outcome model is just a part of the game. So you really, even in the Bayesian approach, maybe uh, in the Bayesian approach, you can do something, at least you can do two things. It's first is that, well, Bayesian model, if you just look at the model itself, it's purely about the analysis stage. So then in order for you to do Bayesian, you need to first have a good data, a good like data, good data what means? Means that I first do some, ensure good covariate balance initially, and then on top of that, I do a Bayesian model. So of course, the most extreme case is if you can have the luxury to random, randomized experiment, you can have a randomized experiment, and then you can do Bayesian model on that randomized experiment. So there's a very famous result by, from Fisher and then Winston Ling, later to Winston Ling. It's, it's really to say that if you have a randomized data, that's in principle will be well balanced, the treatment group and control group are very similar. Then if, even if your outcome model is misspecified, doesn't matter. You still have consistent results. So that, that's a very well-known theoretical result. Why is that? It's because if you are having a great, a very well-balanced or randomized study, so in any part of the data, you can just non-parametrically go to calculate the y1 bar and y0 bar. You do a model, it gives you a little bit more efficiency, but in principle, you don't need it. Uh, so that, of course, the most extreme case. That's when you have the treatment group and control group are perfectly balanced. And now of observational study, we don't have that luxury. So what we should do is we should first actually make the data, so use a propensity score to matching or weighting whatever, uh, to make the study very close to a randomized experiment, as close as possible. And then on top of that, with that data, it's like we do a model-based approach on a matched data set or on a uh, weighted sample set. So the second, so, so this is the first first way you can do. And, and another approach is, of course, if your model is sensitive, at least try to make it as, fle as flexible as possible to, well, make it flexible so that it's less prone to model misspecification. So that's why the idea like use beta and non-parametric models, those are very useful. But again, I would argue that if you do well here, this this approach is more secondary. So, so then this turned out this idea of why don't we just directly incorporate propensity score into outcome model? But then that also have it's the open order can of worms that as Francesca mentioned. So that's after five minutes break, we'll come back and then revisit this issue. The second half is uh, a bit more interesting. I'm like more called to the <laughs> to the issue uh, to 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 Bayesian. Uh, so I want to go a bit slowly here. Uh, talk about this. So remember last time, just a very quick recap, we realized uh, even on the contrary to the, so there's almost a paradox to say, oh, on one side hand, you don't need a uh, propensity score or assignment mechanism. On the other hand, you definitely need. Uh, so where does the reconciliation come from? Well, then for a long time, people realize, well, after many years of exploration, 
all the uh, all the authors come into the same conclusion that is even as a Bayesian, you still preventive schools still play a central role. So, but if you're Bayesian, you do a model, then where does that come? Uh, where does that preventive school get into the outcome model? Well, the it becomes you can directly incorporate propensity score into the outcome model. Okay, so there actually turned out to be multiple approaches. There's no consensus of how to achieve that, uh, but there are some approaches here. Uh, there are at least four different approaches. Uh, so this was originally was uh, uh, so the first approach is just purely use propensity score as a covariate. So remember, propensity score is a function of x. Uh, so just to use that as, the, uh, as a covariate. So this was originally come from the, the earliest one from the uh, Ruben 85. So he said, well, why don't you just use the propensity score as the only covariate in the outcome model? Because if you know anything about propensity score, you know that propensity score is supposed to be a one-dimensional summary of all the covariates. Uh, so turn out that that's actually not a good idea. Um, because plenty of uh, studies show that this has turned out to be that you know, the propensity score as a dimension reduction tool is too drastic shrinking. So with this, you are actually turned out to be sensitive if you just use this as, as only covariate. Uh, so then this is get to uh, Corey Ziegler uh, and also Francesca. They did a series very important paper is they realized, well, instead use the propensity score as additional covariate. Okay, so that is actually a very interesting Idea. So, so instead, they say that, well, you use a propensity score here as additional covariate. So you have this outcome model, but you use propensity additional covariate. Um, I will talk about it in a moment. Um, so, so why do you do that? So, so if you, this actually later to know that this is almost like a basic an analog to double robustness. So let me explain that in a, in a moment. So. When you put the propensity score, again, this is quote, unquote, true propensity score. You can put the true propensity score there. So if, this, this is the thing, if the outcome model is indeed correctly specified, you're adding the true propensity score. I mean, the, in, the end, in the end, we don't have the true one. But if you put propensity, because the propensity score is a function of x, it's like this is auxiliary. So if the outcome model is correctly specified, adding this, it's like it's redundant, you don't gain anything, but you don't lose anything. You lose one degree of freedom, but that's that's all the price you pay. But the key point is really this: if the outcome model is misspecified, which most of the time is the case, then adding the propensity score here as additional covariate, you are actually almost like you 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 are actually doing something like this. I always say this is so. What do you actually do? Just think of a linear model. Think of a linear model, you have x, z, and then propensity score as additional covariate. What you're really doing is almost like, you're like given each particular propensity score value, you're doing a regression of x and z. So in a sense, it's like a continuous version of stratification. You first almost like you are stratifying the data first by the propensity score, and then within each that small stratum, you do a regression. Right? So of course, this is, this is a continuous version of that. It's slightly more complicated. But so in other words, that when the outcome model is misspecified, because you are first, this, this propensity score adding this is almost like an anchor. The anchor is so that it's doing this stratification type of thing to make sure that the treatment group and control group are similar in covariates. So it's less, then it will be less sensitive. So that was the idea. So that, that's, then I realized this is basically a Bayesian analog of double robustness. And then some people actually indeed mentioned that. So that is, in other words, funny enough, to put the propensity score as additional covariate, you are actually doing a continuous version of mixing the propensity stratification and outcome modeling. And you are actually achieving double robustness. So that's, that, that's actually very cool. Um, so, and, then there are actually different approach of doing that, right? Different approach of doing that. So this is, I think, Corey's paper and Francesca's paper. They were talking about, and later I will talk about this. In practice, we don't have this. We have e hat. <laughs> then, uh, but they show that for the first time, as far I know, that adding the propensity <coughs> score is is ultra important because that stabilizes a lot of the that makes the, the 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 inference much much better. Um, so then. Actually, this idea was kind of 
um, independent discovered by multiple groups of uh, uh, researchers. Uh, so the uh, so, so you still the key thing is you still want this model to be flexible. So Raw Little and colleagues have several similar ideas, but they're not Bayesian. They just purely say the model based. And then this uh, this paper, they're the first Bayesian version of that. So those little, they also similar idea. The similar idea is, OK, I'm going to reparameterize this, still use the Provence score as additional covariance. And what you do is you are having a parametric model here of the treatment effect like the x and z. But then everything else, just uh, everything else is uh, you use a propensity score. It's a non-parametric like penalized splines. Uh, so you can achieve this double robustness. It's a similar idea, but it's just different parameterization. And as I already mentioned, the Han et al. paper have this based in causal forest. Remember, they were saying that uh, a few pages before, I said that their idea actually was to separate the outcome model into the baseline model and the treatment of heterogeneous treatment factor model. But then they say that after did many numerical examples, they realized, well, if you want to do this really well, you have to put the propensity score, like it's a good idea to put the propensity score in the baseline model. They find that adding this makes this similar as uh, Ziegler's uh, discovery that putting the propensity score in one part of this model, in this particular case, uh, the complicated baseline model, that improved the estimation much, much better. OK, so then they, yeah, it's crucial to include this propensity score into this, uh, this uh, basic part of the model. And then there are other researchers, uh, Roy at, or like uh, Michael Daniels, they, they like to use Gaussian process priors uh, to, to, into those, but the parameterization is still the same. But they, like whether, this is a frequentist, this is Bayesian, but no matter what, the key idea is you need to use, a, you need to put the propensity score into this outcome model somewhere. You cannot do it. If you don't do that, you will, in principle, in practically, you, you will run into a very poor performance. OK, so now this is a feedback. This is the issue that uh, Francesca mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you so think about this, adding the propensity score into as an additional auxiliary, but important auxiliary covariate into outcome model is not a new idea. It's originally also called inference is also very related to survey. Okay? So in the survey literature, for the longest time, people use the sampling weights to augment the design, the so-called design-based estimate. Essentially, they use the, the sampling weights as, as a you know, predictor. And sampling weights is it's basically propensity score. It's a, it's a functional, it's an inverse of propensity score. So this has a tradition. Okay? So, but in practice, there's some practical issue there is well, we don't know the propensity score in observational study, right? We need to estimate it. So we need to have an E hat. We estimate this and then plugging the E hat into the, the model we specified. OK, so this is what we will do. Uh, so, but they, they start to have controversies. You know, causal people tend to argue. And uh, they are some for philosophical reasons, some purely for personality. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, but, <laughs> so for controversies. Um, so for, oh, oh, and also Bayesians are very philosophically, uh, you know, they, they're also a different, different type of people. So you can imagine these two groups of people uh, getting two together. Right? So, so some Bayesian people, well, I think Francesca first, first hand had experience, right? Like this is really not dogmatically Bayesian. Because you are really, your first asthma the problem, you do this two-stage thing. You know, the, uh, so I, I will talk about this point in the next slides. Uh, but like this is really not the pristine Bayesian would do. But okay, so so let let's first talk about the, the causal people, what they are arguing. They're saying that this no 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 no. Why does the out, true outcome generating process, basically the outcome model, depends on the assignment. It's like the truth, how the underlying truth is, that should have nothing to do with how I design, how I instruct the study. I don't personally like particularly Jamie Robbins. Uh, and uh, they, they, they are really against it. They, they wrote a series of papers <laughs> against that. Uh, for me, it's not a big problem because I use it as auxiliary uh, kind of tool to deal with. I don't really think the outcome model depends on the propensity score. This is just purely auxiliary. So I don't think philosophically this even is an issue. But th th this was original the issue. But I think a bigger issue is probably the feedback. OK, so let's step back here. So in a full Bayesian word, 
So if you're really Bayesian, what you do is you model everything, right? So a natural way will be simultaneously infer the outcome model and propensity score model, not do this two-stage thing. So instead, so you will have this, you first, you model this, and you, model, you will do it together jointly. And uh, then, so, so, so the key, also Bayesian would say that, well, if you are just the first estimate of the propensity score, and then plug in, you are basically ignore the uncertainty in estimating the propensity. Okay, so those are all issues. Why don't you just do simultaneously, and then the, the, you don't have that problem? Oh, uh, well, there, so the idea is doing so will allow the propensity score estimate, the propensity uncertainty propagate, propagation in the final estimate. Uh, so again, life is easy when the outcome model is correct. When the outcome model is correct, you don't need to do any of this. Uh, the problem is when the outcome is misspecified, this creates a huge issue. Because then the propensity score, so if this is misspecified, remember? If this, if this is correctly specified, this thing, this is auxiliary, it doesn't provide any additional information. But if it's misspecified, then the propensity score will actually affect the outcome model. So what, then that is strange, because then the propensity score model would be informed, so because you're also doing these two things simultaneously. So it's kind of one would affect the other, the other, they will affect each other. So then the propensity score estimate would actually be, go back, also, oopsie, go back to be informed by the outcome model. So it goes both ways, because if you are model both things in the same, simultaneously, so whatever in one model will feed back to the other model. So that's called a feedback issue, because why? Because remember what unconfoundedness assumption said. Unconfoundedness assumption says, says that, uh, says that you know, the assignment mechanism have nothing to do with the potential outcomes. But here, if your model is misspecified, the outcome model actually will inform your propensity score. So that is just a violation. Like when you have a misspecified, it violates the unconfounded assumption. And theoretically, this is, this is conceptually, but practically it will just completely distort your, your study, right? So this is called the feedback. So empirically, when the outcome model is misspecified, the joint model lead, lead to very severely biased uh, causal estimate, and I, I remember Corey probably first run into many of that problems and then realized, well, we have to cut this feedback. So that's from a Bayesian, traditional Bayesian perspective, what are the issues, what are the strange problems there. So, so again, this, we, we, I talk about this. So then Corey actually from that, or Francesca, uh, from that perspective, they realized, oh, you know, this feedback is really a problem. So in order to cut the feedback, then they realize, go back to the original, we still we have to do this two-stage thing, is so we first build a Bayesian model for the propensity score, and then we plug in the posterior jaws of this propensity score so that we take into account of the uncertainty in the first stage into the base, uh, Bayesian call, uh, outcome model. So, so then, oh, th this is one, this is actually McCandless uh, approach. Or the, uh, then, this is actually still a bit cumbersome approach, but then, Corey realized from this perspective of cutting feedback, realized it's essential to actually, you have kind of no choice but to add the estimate propensity score as an additional covariate into the outcome. I'll have to do this two stage thing. So this is, this is another, like only yesterday I realized this is actually, I would, in retrospect, I would say this is another motivation of the, you know, the one we deal with is the paradox between the, uh, and reconciliate the, the role of the propensity score in, a model-based approach is cut back is actually another angle to say that why cut the cut, cut back is another angle why we have to get propensity score into the analysis. Uh, so, but again, the really if you are full Bayesian, this is on like I, I if you're full Bayesian like some people in my department, this is really uh, very uneasy because this is not full Bayesian. They will yell at you, right? So then I feel this is a self-inflated problem, unique to Bayesian inference. Why do you even do this? So like, you want to do Bayesian, but then because of Bayesian, you have to do this two stage. You first add some propensity score, and then plug in the propensity score, and that become not Bayesian. <laughs> so, so, so then what, right? So again, if you're a causal person, I don't, or, or you're a practical person, um, <coughs> Well, I'm not saying full Bayesian or practical. I'm just saying that uh, if you are, if you do a, a real analysis or real applications, realize that the debate of those are not very important. It is really about how do I get 
uh, have a model, a complex model enough to, to, to deal with the, the, the problem in hand and how can I get a less biased, like a good result. And then, so again and again from all different uh, concepts, uh, different angles, we realize adding the additional covariance, add the preventing additional covariance is, is, a, is a good way. Mm. So another approach, actually I love this approach from academic perspective, but uh, practically it, it is a different matter. So another group of uh, researchers say that, well, a lot of those trouble actually arise because we assume this seemingly innocent assumption, say independent priors for, you know, we assume that this prior independence say that the treatment assignment and the outcome model, they are a priori, the priors, uh, the, the, the parameters are a priori distinct and independent. So we made that assumption just by, you know, just a few, few convenience. And it turned out that this is actually a very strong assumption, I will tell in a, in a moment. Uh, this assumption is not as like, it actually has strong uh, consequence. So then the idea is that why don't we actually specify priors? We don't need this because this might not be the case. So we can specify priors for outcome that is uh, dependent on propensity score. So we, we actually say this two mechanism, assignment mechanism, outcome mechanism, they are related to each other. So we can, we can use, again, the strength of Bayesian is you can have the prior, you can specify priors to reflect that. So this is, one point paper is uh, by Wang et al. Again, this is uh, uh, both Francesca and uh, Giovanni on that paper. Uh, so this paper is, is a very good example of that. So what did they, what they do is they specify dependent prior for variable selection in both the propensity score and the outcome model and then make them dependent. And then some other, there are some other attempt in the, uh, um, in the literature also about this idea is to design some Gaussian process prior stuff, but, but so, so then, yeah, as I mentioned that this, there's actually epic, there's uh, uh, Ritov and Sims also give uh, similar attempts of this. Um, so I give some example, this is, I don't know, I mean, how many of you know the spike and slap prior? Uh, maybe not. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to skip <laughs> this part. So the idea is th this paper basically say that, well, if you have a propensity score model, you need a propensity score model, you need an outcome model. And in both cases, you have a lot of covariates. So you want to do some selection, right? You want to select your propensity score model, you select your outcome model. So this, uh, this paper essentially designed the prior so that allow how like, let's say, basically allow how likely this covariate is included in the propensity score model is correlated with how likely this is included in the outcome model. Because often in practice, they are correlated. So that you, you can actually de devise a very clever way uh, to design that. And uh, so, that, so in that case, you are basically allowing the propensity score model and the outcome model are a priori related. Okay, so this is all very nice, except that you, except that nobody uses this <laughs> because it's complicated. It's like you have to tailor made almost for any problem you have. And people like simp uh, simple. So this prior essentially forces the propensity score to enter the posterior inference for the, for the uh, uh, average treatment effect. Uh, so this is a nice idea. And then there's another idea, it's also by a little 2004. It's a, it's a, this is actually a very clever mathematical construction but sounds weird um, when I look at it. So <laughs> this is, people remember so far everyone was talking about the put the propensity score in the um, outcome model directly. Like that's the mean of the outcome model. So, so this paper, they, 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 they find a clever way. They say, well, if I build an outcome model for the treatment group and for a control group, the difference is they, somehow, they put the propensity score enter, they use the propensity score to, inf to kind of characterize the variance. So, so it's really a, a very strange, I would say a very strange construction. But what they proved is that if the propensity score are known, then the posterior mean of the average treatment effect coming, back, coming from this construction will just look like the, it's essentially the higher estimated. 
So, so it's a higher class way. It's just a, it's a fancy version of a, it's a normalized version of IPW, right? So, so then they are so so if the propensity is for unknown, the posterior mean of this is closely related to. So, so the point is that you can do this this construction so that the outcome, so the propensity score directly enter the outcome model, uh, and the strategy into the PS additional variance. Uh, into the conditional variance rather than conditional mean of the potential outcome. So, so they're also, you know, very cool idea, but not very useful. Um, because <laughs> not very useful in the sense that it's, it's just, you have to design this thing for almost every case. Come, like it's very case by case. Nobody has the time to develop those things. Okay, so this, so then for the longest time, people still assume this, just adding the, use the approach one. But this is a very cool uh, method. Uh, so the third approach is also this. Uh, it's also a paper Francesca is on. The uh, Francesca is on all of it. So this is actually the uh, the. Uh, there are several authors. So this uh, Joey Antonini and uh, Georgia, uh, are both a student or postdoc of uh, Francesca. So they have this idea. They say that well. Uh, I didn't talk about double robust estimation here, but double robust estimation is basically IPW estimation. So it's combined IPW and the outcome model, right? So you have this double robust estimator. So their idea is, well, why don't I just specify a separate model for the propensity score, a separate Bayesian model for the outcome model, and then I just uh, have the posterior predictive distribution from both models, and then I use the double robust uh, formula, just combine them. I remember the paper's name is a marriage between. <laughs> it's a marriage. Yeah, it's a marriage between uh, double robust or uh, so or a perfect marriage or something. Anyway, so it's oh, of course, it is has been written by two married couple, me and Giovanni and Joy and Georgia. <laughs> Not two, yeah, yeah. So they're four authors and the two couples. Then the the paper's title is a marriage. Um, so so that, ah, I see. Yeah, anyway, so so the idea is actually to combine really the using double robust estimate, uh, estimator as a form to combine these two different posterior distributions. So the advent and then they prove the uh, asymptotically the the, uh, the consistency actually you can prove the frequentist uh, properties of this kind of pseudo or half Bayesian approach. So it's easy to implement. Flexible choice of the models and the proper uncertain quantification. This is all approved. This is a very nice paper in biometrics. <laughs> Again, some people don't like it, especially for for Bayesian. This is for for pure Bayesian. Again, in my department, this is hard to stomach because this is not dogmatic Bayesian. Uh, because you're you. How can you do this two things separately, right? But then by this point, you, by now you probably see like why is people are so insist on <laughs> being dogmatic Bayesian. Um, well, some people are. Uh, so the last one is also a strange uh, approach. Uh, well, it's not strange. It's, it's I was like, why? Uh, so Bayesian bootstrap. Uh, how many of you know Bayesian bootstrap? <laughs> so Bayesian bootstrap. Oh, we you all know bootstrap. And then once Bayesian bootstrap. Okay, so Bayesian bootstrap. It's 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 a paper by Ruben. Also Ruben in eighty one. Uh, the paper, if you go look at it, it's five pages in annals. Nowadays, you never see five pages annals paper. Everyone writes papers too long, like 30 pages stuff. But it's, it's a great idea. So it's, it's technical, technically, I'm not going to say. It's basically a general strategy. It's a non-parametric strategy to simulate posterior distribution of any parameters from a non-parametric model. So basically, if you have a non-parametric procedure, you can use it. This is just a, a procedure of uh, it kind of it's essentially a reweighting. You're doing the you're doing bootstrap, but you kind of you're reweighting. Uh, you don't need to know the details if you, uh, you just know that this is general strategy uh, because it, you can prove that it's turned out to be the limit of the inference of a Dirichlet process prior. Uh, so remember when we talk about oh I didn't talk about IPW or double robustness, but these two type of uh, uh, approaches. They are Bayesian. Oh, sorry, they're, they're not Bayesian. They are model. They're, they're model free. They're non-parametric. So essentially, you use this procedure just can crank any. You can turn any non-parametric estimator into a Bayesian, a basic a Bayesian approach. Um, so it's a, just a general recipe to converting any frequent uh, non-parameter uh, non-parametric uh, methods into a Bayesian approach. So there are several attempts in the in the literature about that. Uh, this one. 
I actually do have, uh, as, as a half-hearted Bayesian, or Bayesian wannabe, I actually have problem with this one. Because they, they, I was asking myself, what's the advantage if you are, what's the advantage? Is this just purely ba being Bayesian for the sake of being Bayesian? Because you are essentially converting any frequency approach and use this uh, Bayesian bootstrap to, to make it Bayesian. But then what's the point? Re really, like there are other ways. But there are people who, who, who does this. So, so that's, that's another approach. But you can see in all of this, it's because this <coughs> involves the propensity score. This also involves the propensity score. So you can see that this way, propensity score is also included in the, in the Bayesian inference. So there are just two, four different approaches. I would say that the first one is still the most widely used. And also, to me, I think it's, uh, it's the most elegant and useful way, uh, well, use also practical way, just to use the propensity score as additional covariate, do this two-stage approach. OK, so then that is the, uh, about how do you involve propensity score into the uh, Bayesian analysis. So first, we already said that it turned out from many aspect, from any aspect, propensity score, it, it become clear, propensity score play a central role also in the Bayesian analysis uh, of of call the inference. It's just how do you incorporate that? It's, it's, there are different approaches. And then we, we showed that. Uh, so now we jump into another uh, section. Another important, it's just like we know that high dimensions always change the game. So high dimensional data bring additional uh, challenges. When we talk about high dimensional, actually we usually, make, there are two different regimes. Uh, so there are two, two different things we're talking about. The first is that, well, if you have, oh, okay, most people probably think about high dimensional as high dimensional covariates. It's like, I have a lot of covariates. I have high dimensional, I need to control that. Uh, I need to do model selection, things like that. Uh, but if you're Bayesian, you know that high dimensional, we also mean something like this. Model itself has a large number of parameters. For example, non-parametric models. They have a lot of uh, parameters. So like Bayesian non-parametric models, they are high dimensional. So in reality, the model applications really involve both problems uh, but, but encountered. So, so then let's step back to think about what Bayesians do in high dimensional. There's a huge improvement in Bayesian approach to high dimensional study outside causal inference. Um, so what people usually do in, in Bayesian is like first, it's called, so in frequent is a high dimensional, of course, it's a regularization. Um, statistician usually is pretty, we are pretty bad in giving names. We call penalty. You know, the penalty sounds so, so terrible, but in, in machine learning people will say regularization or sounds, sounds much nicer. Uh, so, so Bayesian is, yeah, so we, we use prior, to, informative prior on the parameters to, to, uh, to achieve regular, regularization. For example, Bayesian lasso, Bayes lasso, or uh, many different type of things, like the Bayesian non-parametric priors, you know, and sparsity priors, spike and style priors. But again, the key feature of Bayesian high dimensional methods is to use informative prior on the parameters so that you can do prior selection, you can force sparsity uh, into, into the uh, parameter space. Uh, so, so then that become very important. So for Bayesian, it's very important what kind of priors you choose. Okay, so the choice of, remember, we are talking about outcome model. We, we were earlier say, well, you can do an outcome model, but if you have low dimensional, you can just have your linear model, and then, you know, does it have a non-informative prior, everything's fine. But if you are in high dimensional, you almost always forced into some, some more advanced models here. Like, we say use, we often say BART prior, or GP prior, those are essentially themselves are models, okay? so. So then the question is, yeah, you can choose bar prior, you can choose Gaussian process or DP, the uh, derivative process, or, or polyar tree. There's so many priors you can choose in high, in high dimension. I mean, in low dimension, there's no point of doing all of this. High dimension, you have all the things to do, all of this uh, priors you choose, but, but which one to choose? It's, this is another thing, like the frequentists say, well, I don't want to do Bayesian because if I'm a frequentist, I, <laughs> I just use my lasso, use my, uh, uh, use my regularization regression, I don't have the trouble of the choose the pri uh, priors, okay? So then uh, frequent, then in Bayesian have, you, you have this additional tool of incorporating 
information from uh, the, the data information from the priors to to help you. You have this. This is a double-edged sword. On one hand, you have a prior informative prior can give you a lot of extra power that the frequentist approach cannot achieve. On the other hand, you have this additional task. You need to choose, make a good priors. Uh, so which one to choose? So a uh, lot of people say BART, because BART indeed is, is very successful in many cases. And But back to the original, my original point of doing any model, I mean, even prior is a model, right? Prior essentially is a high dimension, it's a, it's a model. Doing any model, if you don't look at the data, the, the model itself won't tell you anything about the data. You need to incorporate, or, or let's say this way. So ideally, so in causal inference, a key thing, so what is special about causal and Bayesian? So the key challenging case in causal inference is the region when there's no lack of overlap. So remember, as I mentioned that, if you have randomized trial, life is easy. You can just go to calculate the y1 bar minus y0 bar. But once you have, what is really complicated in practice is when you have a data that the treatment group and control group look different. So then this does, how does the Bayesian approach, like outcome approach, take into account of that? That's important. So I would argue that a, prior, a desirable prior should accurately reflect the uncertainty for various degree of overlap. So, so my point is that if a data, if the data, if I look at the data and find that the treatment group and control group are very different, so in other words, they have lack of overlap or they are not very balanced, then a prior should, a good prior should adaptively let me know that in this region I have less information, then should give more uncertainty. Okay, so that was the idea. So that. I mean, again, the, the Bayesian, why do, do people do Bayesian? One key reason is Bayesian can give good uncertainty quantification. But in causal inference, a big source of uncertainty comes from the degree of overlap between two groups. That's very special about uh, causal inference. So then if you're doing Bayesian, of course, you want your prior to accurately reflect that. Uh, so then this becomes, yes? May I ask you how you evaluate that aspect? Oh, wait, I, I'm going to give an example. Yeah, I, I don't evaluate, I'm just like, okay, so this is a final example. So, so I did a simple example um, to, to kind of showcase. It, it's very hard to evaluate, but you, can, you kind of know, depends on how you see the, the prior is constructed, you, you will have ideas. Some are good, some are not that good. So I construct a simple example. So this example is, I have only one covariance to make life easy. So I have a treatment group, I have a control group. So you can see that, and that, that this is, let's say this is H, so let's say the, so you can see that these two groups, it's only in this, in this middle part, there's some overlap, and then in this two part, they, they, the covariance, like the, 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 the two groups look very different, okay? I mean, I'm saying the, the, the covariates, it's just the covariates. And so I fit, this is a constant treatment effect uh, case, a toy example. So what I did is I showed the, what I did was, uh, oopsie, so, uh, yeah, so, so what I did is I, I simulate this data, it's a constant treatment effect, it's uh, or around five, basically it's around eight, and then this, I simulate this so that the treatment group and control group are very different, and then I wrote, this is a simple case, you, you linear model is good enough, but I also did Gaussian process and uh, the BART. It's a very vanilla version. So you can see that what this is the result. It's, it's very interesting is you can see linear. So this is the region where around 40, this is where I have most overlap. So you would imagine that you should have the least uh, uncertainty. But then in this region and this region, this basis is no overlap. So essentially, so no matter what, what your model is, so in reality, you have very little information to tell me about the treatment effect in this region and in that region. So, so then you should expect your, when you have a prior, your outcome model will tell you the uncertainty in these two regions should be big. So you can see that actually GP, so this is outcome, this is the effect, I just separate this. You can see that GP actually achieves that. So, so Gaussian process is, 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 uh, has its own problem, but Gaussian process 
if you know a little bit about Gaussian process, it's kind of small smoothing. It's like neighborhood smoothing. It's just keep smooth, smooth, smooth. And so when it realized it doesn't have data here, it will just automatically increase the uncertainty. So let's see what the linear model does. Linear model also realized, oh, there's, you know, realized, okay, there's not much data. The, the uncertainty increased a bit, but not too much. You know, understood. But it at least increased. But let's also look at BART. Uh, so let's look at BART. So, so what is BART? BART it's basically a tree structure, right? So, so it, it's, it's random for, but let's think of it as a simple, it's a tree. So what does this kind of tree approach does is it's assume the same tree structure everywhere in the, in the space, in the parameters, uh, in, in the covariate space. So it doesn't matter, it, does, it cannot, because it, it's, a, it's kind of the hard thresholding in a sense, it's just, uh, it just divides the space into those um, leaves or these uh, rectangles. And so it assumes it doesn't really adaptively uh, reflect the uncertainty according to you know, the lack of overlap. So you can see what it does. Not surprising, like, even though here it doesn't have much data, it still will it increase uncertainty but just by not too much. So you can see the comparison of the average treatment, the treatment effect comparison. It's more or less, I mean, it's maybe like this. It's more or less the same. It doesn't really reflect the, so you can see the point estimate is uh, around here is all the same, but then it's really, when you don't have data, you have, should have a large uncertainty, but you can see the BART cannot, this raw BART does not solve that problem, okay? So again, this is a simple example. You ask me how do I evaluate that? Well, we don't, but I do know like the, this is just illustrative example. Of course, BART people say that, well, uh, th this problem can be solved actually by the, like use the Bayesian uh, random forest, use two BART. It's, get, it's better than that because again, that has <laughs> divide the, well, th there's, a, there's a way of doing that. And another approach is called use the soft BART. That's where the, uh, uh, some, some recent version of uh, BART is uh, soft BART. Also, instead of doing this hard thresholding, it, it makes it uh, softer so it can adaptively um, reflect the uncertainty. But the point of this example is really to show you that the Bayesian, so in high dimensional, in low dimensional, well, in high, well, here, high dimensional really means the model is complex. So in Bayesian, it's important to choose a prior or, or some model uh, that should uh, accurately reflect the uncertainty for various degree of overlap. So try to avoid, again, I'm not saying bad is, uh, barn is not good because you can actually have a relatively simple fix like use the Bayesian forest, then this problem is solved, or use a soft bar. But if you just use the vanilla bar, then you are having this kind of issue that cannot adaptively reflect the uncertainty according to the lack of overlap. And this is a problem very specific to causal inference because overlap is such an important concept. Um, so any questions about this example? So it's, uh, yeah, I got a lot of heat from uh, the uh, BART people say that you're, <laughs> you're making, I, I actually didn't, I, I just, this is the first simulation example I come, I didn't cherry pick, I didn't do 1,000, once choose one that really unfavor BART, it's just a vanilla version and then it doesn't work, yeah, you can do some, so this is just showing them uh, the, the danger of that and then some people also use a Dirichlet process mixture also get similar issue, but the key point is that it's a Bayesian, the strength of Bayesian is to do uncertain quantification. But uncertain quantification should definitely, in causal setting, should include the uh, uncertainty due to the lack of overlap. And then the choice of different priors is important because that, that can have different properties in terms of its ability of reflecting that. So that's the first point. So the f second point is also very interesting, pretty recent studies, several recent studies. It's called, um, okay. So, well, there are different names of that, but uh, it's what someone called the regularization inducing confounding. I don't particularly like the name because it's, it's uh, but the idea is pretty, so, so what it says that, remember, in use Bayesian, you use a spike and slap or, or regularization prior. The, the key thing is you're still doing the regularize your model so that it reduce the, the, the give the, the sparsity, right? So the, the idea, so they find, this, those authors find that with large P, the Bayesian regular, regularization on the nuisance parameters in a causal model, like sometimes in causal inference, we have like a pri, the, the, the primary estimate est is the ATE, but the, there are a lot of 
nuisance parameters, and to do Bayesian, you have to have priors for basically everything. But then it would be, they notice that sometimes, seemingly, innocuous priors actually will cause trouble, cause uh, uh, prior like bias to that. And, and uh, it's really, the, this paper, it's, it's a recent paper uh, by uh, Linaro, actually uh, uh, forthcoming in JASA, um, very elegantly described this. So, so he was saying that, okay, so let's define something called selection bias. Well, also what is selection, so, sorry, but this is unconditional X. Selection bias is basically the difference between the Y in the observed arm versus the potential outcome, the error potential outcome. And we know that without the, if you conditional X, then this two will be zero. If you unconditional, that's not. So that's called selection bias. So what the narrow find is very interesting. It's a, so they find that if, remember earlier we mentioned that in Bayesian, you make this assumption called prior independence. The prior, the, the propensity score model and the outcome model are, pri, are priori independent, the, the parameters, right? So this assumption is standard. So he actually find that in high dimensional case, so the standard uh, Bayesian shrinkage priors, so there, there are many type of, the, the, the Bayesian high dimensional is, is all about shrinkage. So the standard Bayesian shrinkage priors for this models, for the prior and for the outcome model and propensity score model, they will lead to this guy a priori concentrate sharply around zero as p increase. Okay, what does that mean? So you're saying that well, you know, Bayesian have often very standard uh, priors to use like spike and slab, Bayesian non-parametric prior, uh, but it turned out that actually if you are assuming this prior independence, which we take it for granted what this assumption itself actually enforce the very strong information already in the analysis. So, so you find that he showed this example, it's like when your P is the number of uh, parameters, is the number of the covariates. When P equals one, this is the posterior concentration of this uh, uh, selection bias. So of course this is, uh, you know, this is pretty kind of, a little bit, it's concentrated, it's, it's a relatively flat around zero, right? But what is troublesome is as your P increase, as your number of parameters, uh, number of covariates increase, this will just sharp and sharp, sharply concentrate around, around zero. So what does that mean? Basically say that if you have a high dimensional, uh, if you have a lot of covariates, and you are using Bayesian, the standard Bayesian shrinkage priors, what you actually, and you are assuming the prior independence assumption that almost everyone assume. What you are doing is actually, uh, what the, as the parameter, as the covariates, number of covariates increase, the priors will so sharply concentrated around zero that it's, there's no hope even from the data you can recover because it's so sharply uh, associated, uh, concentrated, because this, Essentially, this prior independence assumption force the prior a priori to sharply concentrate around zero. Essentially, your high default you will actually get closer and closer to say that oh, there's no selection bias, and this is actually a violation of the uh, unconfoundedness. So this is called prior dogmatism. Um, so that that's so this says that. Prior independence assumption, which looks almost like, well, this is just a standard innocuous, actually acts as informative prior so strong that when the dimension is getting higher and higher, it, it will distort the analysis so much that you will not, it will be no hope to recover, even with more and more data, you will no hope to recover the underlying truth. Um, so this later turned out, it turned out it's just a basic analog of the robbins ritov problem, the, the curse of dimensionality, the, the coda uh, problem. So there's some deep um, theoretical connection to that. I don't think the paper actually was very clear about that. And when I was, <laughs> when I was reviewing the paper, I realized, oh, this is it's the same thing, just a Bayesian version. And this is again back to this uh, Rubens uh, quote, say that you know, any problems in one form of inference come up in the other form of inference. So this is a kind of a Bayesian uh, rec discover rec discovery of the Bayesian analog of the robbins of high curse of high dimensional problem. Uh, and again, after all of that, uh, this also say that, well, how do we solve that problem? Add the propensity score into the model. 
So it's, it's very fun, it's, uh, it's very funny to see that all the people, all the smart people in the end doing Bayesian causal inference come back to the same conclusion. You have to add the, add, uh, the, the propensity score into all the time model. Once you do that, this thing mitigate, like go, go away. Okay, so, so that is like there's no free lunch. There, you cannot, at the Bayesian, you cannot just bypass propensity score. So I feel that this is, um, to me it's very, uh, when I do this review, thinking about this, it's also, it's very instruction, uh, it's very interesting philosophical, like going, going a loop and then back to the, uh, to what kind of the frequency is not in the longest time. But, 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 but I'm, I'm, Bayesian have additional benefit. Um, so I think we are coming to the end to summarize what we have learned is Bayesian called the inference. So yeah, it's a marriage. The marriage between the two is anything special. Is it just Bayesian and uh, you're using Bayesian model for called the inference? So at least as I realize that there are a few things unique to this uh, combination. First is the, the seemingly paradoxical uh, role of propensity score. It's actually not paradox. It turned out that in the end it's still, if you do call the inference, you have to look at the, uh, the design, which is the assignment mechanism of propensity score and the outcome. And you need both. So Bayesian is the same. As Bayesian is no way uh, Bayesian get around that. And second is in high dimensional settings, how Bayesian deal with all this outcome model is you see the prior, you see a shrinkage prior. And then shrinkage prior, they have issues also here. Remember, uh, this is one thing, one interesting thing is, if you're a frequentist, you don't need this assumption. If you're a frequentist, because you don't have priors. So you never even need to assume the prior dependence. So this prior independence assumption is pretty unique to Bayesian. And that actually caused an interesting issue in high dimensional regime is, uh, you know, this is prior dogmatism or regularization induced uh, confounding. This is also pretty unique to the Bayesian called inference, but there's also solution to that. It's, again, add the propensity score back. Um, so the, uh, another thing is overlap is still the king. <laughs> overlap, the lack of overlap will cause the sensitive to the choice of the priors. Price essentially is, is type of model and the outcome model. So this is the same in the frequentist domain, also in the Bayesian domain, which is just the, the, in the Bayesian domain that is reflect more in the sensitivity to the choice of the priors. And another issue I mentioned, the identifiability issue, is it's a different concept now in Bayesian. So it's no longer zero or none. It's a continuum between the weak and the strong identification. So those, at least I can see that it's anything special. But of course, I didn't talk about, so I, I should hear, so why and when Bayesian? Uh, so it's funny that in my department, I never need to have this slides because I will just do it. Uh, <laughs> but, but in a general audience, I will say that, well, Bayesian is nice in many aspects, but Bayesian also comes with uh, the price, the conditional price. I mean, it's, uh, so I, I asked Don Rubin why people use, don't use Bayesian like until recent uh, in causal inference. They say that, well, it's, it's conceptually it's easy, but mathematically it's much more sophisticated. 